Right, class, sit down. We're going to cut through this intro quick because we got UFC 291 to talk about. We're going to break this entire fight card down, top to bottom, bottom to top, whatever way you want to look at it. Uh, real quick, find me on patreon.com slash 138MMA where you can get access to my notes, Patreon Parlay, as well as the new feature, my top five favorite bets. We were profitable last week. We're going to be more profitable this week. That is my prediction for that. Can't you know, promise that because that's, you know, how legal things work. But also, Grey Dog Software, you can find my link to them down in the description of this. Uh, they make the World Mixed Martial Arts series. That's the one that I've played because I like mixed martial arts. I don't really care about anything else. Uh, so outside of that, they have a comic book universe game, which is their new one. It's pretty cool from what I understand. But use the link. Check out their games. World of Mixed Martial Arts 5. I highly recommend it. Also, Twitter, 138MMA. Follow me there. Let's go to the videos right after this. Let's break down some fights. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Here we have Priscilla Cachoeira taking on Miranda Maverick. Maverick's two and three in her last five. Priscilla Cachoeira four and one in her last five. Different levels of competition, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, Cachoeira is going to be taller, five seven, as opposed to the five three for Maverick. Reach is about the same, but the height is different, which does make a difference. If you if you're kind of new to this channel, you, you might not have heard this. It's been a while since I've had to explain it, but when you're punching up, your shoulders they fatigue really quickly, whereas when you're punching down, they don't fatigue very fast at all. So for the taller fighter, when you're striking down at your opponent or even straight across, your shoulders can, can last a lot longer. But if you got to punch up, you're going to wear out. Even try it just standing there at home, throwing those punches like that into the air. You're going to feel that real quick. But if you're throwing them down like this, you're going to say, oh, that's way easier. So there is something to be in taller, even if the reach isn't there. Uh, so, so think about that as it is. It's going to fatigue the shoulders. But also... You feel, you seem longer even if you don't have a longer reach just by being taller. It's a real thing. Whatever, take my word on it. Anyway, in this matchup here, Priscilla Cachoeira, she's got one thing she's going to do really well, and that's going to come forward aggressively, zombie style, eat one to give one, or more like eat three to give one. She's going to start throwing shots with power, and when she cracks you, it's going to hurt. She's going to come down and just kind of try to walk you down using that power. Now, here's the problem. She doesn't have very good striking defense. But she's pretty durable, but she doesn't have very good striking defense. So it's basically just eat a few with her face and throw big shots back at you. And if she knocks you out, she knocks you out. However, her takedown defense isn't very good, and she struggles off of her back. She's going up against Miranda Maverick. Miranda Maverick is a pretty good wrestler, but the thing she has is this powerful double leg, and that might be the only thing that she really needs to win this fight. If she can get that double leg under the first shot thrown by Cachoeira, it's over right there. That's probably the end of the fight. She's heavy on top, and she's got a slick arm bar. If you don't know... Miranda Maverick has a very slick arm bar. Look it up. Check out some of her earlier fights. She was getting people with that pretty easily. I don't think she needs it here. I think she can just get on top and just pound it out or just, you know, wait until the fight's over that way. Do that three times, it's over. Uh, but either way, she also got a pretty good cage push if somehow uh, Priscilla Cachoeira stops that first takedown, which I don't think she will. But if she does, she can push her up against the cage, hold her there, and start working for her takedowns from there because those are the two spots she gets them. She either gets it with a powerful double leg or she gets to take down by pushing you up against the cage and taking you down there. Rarely does she work for singles, body locks, things like that. It's double leg or up against the cage. Up against the cage, she might do some different stuff, but like out in space is what I'm talking about. Now, striking. It's decent because it's clean. It looks good. Like if you were just watching her in like a slow-mo video, you'd be like, oh, that looks pretty good, right? But then you realize, oh, that video wasn't in slow-mo. She just strikes slow. I don't know what it is. She seems like she's just slow in her strikes. She's got clean striking. It looks pretty, but it doesn't look fast. And if it's not fast, it's hard to hit people at the UFC level. I don't think she should be striking in this matchup. If she does, it's a bad idea. Maybe throw like a one-two and then duck under just to set up the takedown. Or don't even bother because is going to be swinging bombs right away. Shoot under that shot. Get the takedown. Go from there. Maverick should get the win here. I feel pretty good about it because, well, I mean, she's a big favorite for a reason. I know it's on short notice for Maverick, but I think that she's got this one in the bag. Let me know what you guys think. I'll see you in the next pound matchup here. We have Euros Medic. She's taking on Matthew Semmelsberger. Semmelsberger's 3-2 and two in the last five. 4-1 and one for Medic. This matchup, we got Medic, who is pretty much a striker. He's going to come out with that solid striking. He's got dynamic attack. Very quick. Got good kicks. Works the body well with both punches and kicks. He's good at controlling the range. That's what he's going to do. That's what he's going to want to do. And that's what he's going to need to do against a guy like Semmelsberger, who's kind of just good everywhere, like pretty good everywhere. He's got good striking, very unorthodox movement, which helps him kind of be unpredictable to his opponents. He's got decent volume and decent power. 
the power is not like one shot knockout power, but he knocks guys down. He knocks you down in most or knocks guys down in most fights. So even if that one shot doesn't put you to sleep, it might put you down to the mat. And if it puts you on the mat, well, that you know sure helps you win around that way. So anyway, he's got decent counter strikes, but he's also open to counters of his own. So it's very strange because like he'll be looking for the counter strike, and then he'll throw a big shot at you, and then if you know he's wide open for the counter because he doesn't, he sometimes will strike like this, <laughs> and that's not good. You wanna. One connecting, one protecting, am I right? Now, he's got decent wrestling. He can mix in the takedowns, and he's got decent takedown defense. It's not, like, excellent, but it's decent, and he can mix it in. And the fact that he's athletic helps that a lot. He's also a durable guy, so he's going to have to weather some shots from Medich right away because Medich does start pretty quick. I probably could have wrote that up there, but it didn't. I think Semmelsberger should win this fight. I think he wins this fight most. The, if you run this fight 100 times, I think he wins way more than, more than half. Semmelsberger is probably better here. But Medich is pretty good in that first round, pretty live with those strikes. But I'm going to take, take Semmelsberger here. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you in the next fight. fight. This should be fireworks for as long as it lasts. We have Venetia Salvador. He's 4-1 in his last five. He's taking on CJ Vergara, 3-2 and two in his last five. For Salvador, I classify him as a good striker, but only offensively because his defense is non-existent. He's a very wild striker with a ton of power, ton of volume, but zero striking defense. Now, on the ground, he's got decent jiu-jitsu. He's good at creating scrambles and threatening with submissions, but occasionally he will get content to start working for those and not really working to get back to his feet, things like that. Now, for Vergara, he's a good striker as well. Also been in a lot of wild fights. He got a good forward pressure. He's going to work his combinations, and those body kicks are where it's at. Now, the knees from the clinch is another good uh, tactic that he has. When he does get in that clinch, it's all right. His clinch controls, eh, it's okay, but the knees are very good. Now, decent grappling once it gets to the map. He's kind of just, he's good enough to, to stay safe a lot of the time, work back to his feet. Um, obviously not against Tyra, but, you know, whatever. That, that is what it is. This is a good matchup that I don't think goes to the decision. I think somebody's getting finished in this matchup. And for me, I'm going to take CJ Vergara. Let me know what you guys think, and I will see you next this matchup at welterweight. Darius Flowers, 4-1 in the last five. He's taking on Jake Matthews, who's 3-2 and two in the last five. Matthews, originally slated to take on, I think it was Johan Lioness. Uh, Flower steps in pretty short notice. I think this was made like less than a week ago. So in this one here, we got Darius Flowers. He's a fast starter. The dude comes out of the gate pretty hard. And I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there. I've seen Darius Flowers fight in person quite a few times. Um, he's from Iowa. I'm from Nebraska. If you don't know anything about the United States ge geography, those things are pretty close. So I've seen him fight in Nebraska quite a few times. Um, dude starts the same. He comes out head of steam and tries to take your head off that's what he does whether he does it with his wrestling or his striking that's what he's going to try and do he's got decent striking he's very powerful when he hits you dude looks the part for being you know you look at the guy and you're like yeah he probably hits hard he hits hard uh good wrestling powerful takedowns pick you up slamming on your head whatever he's got to do and when he gets on top that ground and pound is there as well can he fish for submissions yeah sure but the ground and pound is usually what he's going to be going for first uh, the problem is it's short notice who knows how that cardio is going to look on short notice also you know We've seen him fade in the past if the fight goes late. Short notice makes that a little bit worse. But I think if he does this right, he can make this not matter. So he needs to play his game game plan right. Now, for Jake Matthews, dude's a good grappler. He's got good ground and pound in his own right, but he likes to take the back and start fishing for that rear naked choke. That is what he goes for. Gets the rear naked choke in, uh, you know, gets, gets there, gets the control time if he can't get it locked in. That's what he's looking to do. Now, in the striking, he's got good movement on the feet, lands some combinations, and he's good with counter striking. Uh, the problem is he is inconsistent in the volume because sometimes what happens is he gets to moving around, you know, get waiting for that counter shot and then doesn't have it. Bigger problem, he's inconsistent overall. Jake Matthews shows up for some fights and looks like a world beater. And then for other fights shows up and you're like, who's this guy? This isn't Jake Matthews. Did he send in his doppelganger that just can't fight? He's never been that bad, but let's put it this way. Jake Matthews shows up sometimes and you think he's great. And you're like, man, this guy's the next prospect. He's ready to go. And then sometimes he shows up and you're like, man. What's up with Jake Matthews? So for me, I'm just going to go go wild here. I think Darius Flowers gets this one done by knockout in the first round. I think it's going to catch Jake Matthews off guard. I think he's not going to be ready for Flowers to come across the cage. Probably either pick him up, slam him on the ground, start slamming heavy shots, or just come back and sling a big bomb, catch him on the chin, and then just finish it off on the ground. Uh, so I think Darius Flowers gets this one done in round one. 
Don't feel confident in that whatsoever. Don't judge me for that one. He's a huge underdog for a reason. Uh, Jake Matthews, probably skill for skill, is better on his best day, but I don't know which day is going to be his best day, and I can't pick him because he's too inconsistent, and I know consistently that Flowers is going to start quick and try to take his head off. So we're going to go with Flowers with a low-confidence pick. Let me know what you guys have, and I'll see you next Strikers fight. in this one. We have Claudio Ibero taking on Roman Kopilov. From this one here, three and two on the Kapilov side, four and one on the Hibero side in their last five fights, respectively. Both these guys are predominantly strikers. Now I'm going to really quickly cover their grappling. Hibero has the advantage in the wrestling and grappling. He will use it some. Uh, Kapilov just doesn't really use it, uh, doesn't have much defense in it. But either way, it's probably going to be a striking matchup, and I feel like that's not crazy to say. Now, for Hibero, good striking. He's got a ton of power because every single one of his 11 wins are by knockout. And that's what he does. He knocks guys out. So if he's going to win, he's going to get the knockout. Now, he's got good footwork. Um, kind of, you know, a little bit different, but it's, it, it has that good footwork. He can slam heavy leg kicks, and he's going to kind of move forward, hit those leg kicks, and throw the hands, big looping shots, hooks and overhands, things like that. He can actually kind of counter pretty well. And it's weird because um, it, he has trouble countering guys that are super rangy, which might be trouble for him here. But he can counter guys with hooks. Like, he'll, he'll roll with a shot and, and throw a big hook at you, things like that. His counters aren't bad. It's surprising when you think of a guy that comes in with just power punches. He does have good counters. Striking defense isn't the best straight down the middle anyway, and that's going to be a problem because Kapilov. Dude's got a tight defense. He's got good clean straight shots, including his jab. He's got a very stiff jab. He'll set it up, you know, oh, one, 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 two, drop that quick, land it hard. He's got good combinations when he decides to throw in combinations, but a lot of times it's that stick the jab for a while, stick the jab, and then set up the combination later. Um, kicks to all levels. They're all pretty darn good, too. Um, he will use a lot of feints to set up his strikes, which is good, but sometimes can lead to inconsistent volume where he feints a little bit too much, doesn't throw enough strikes. I don't think that's going to be the case here because I think that a guy like Hibero is going to be forcing Kapilov to come forward, or to, I mean to strike while uh, Hibero is coming forward. So for Kapilov, I think he's going to be able to throw those straight shots down the middle, and I think he's going to have to throw them at a pretty decent volume if he's going to just not let Hibero walk him down. So for me, I think Kapilov is going to land the straight shots, Use the kicks a little bit better. Um, I think he's going to be able to land that, that kind of style a little bit better than the hooks from Hibero, the leg kicks from Hibero, things like that. So I'm going to take Kapilov here. Um, I don't think this one sees the scorecards, but I could be crazy. Either way, maybe Hibero knocks out Kapilov. Kapilov gets the, the later finish on Hibero. I think if it ends in the first, it's probably Hibero. After that, it's probably Kapilov. Could be wrong. Either way, Kapilov is the pick. Let me know what you guys think. And I'll matchup see you. where either guy can be put to sleep in the first round or late, and it's just going to be what it is. Uh, Marcos Rogerio de Lima, 4-1 in his last five. He's taking on Derek Lewis, who's 1-4 in his last five, albeit to some of the highest level competition in the heavyweight division. In this one here, for de Lima, guy's a fast starter. He's going to come out of the gate, ready to roll, powerful striking, slamming leg kicks. When he gets on top of you, that jiu-jitsu is not too bad. It's pretty good, actually. He's got heavy, uh, heavy top pressure. Ground and pounds there, and it can potentially open up some submissions. It's also pretty durable, but I don't think that's going to matter because when you get hit by a guy like Derek Lewis, it doesn't matter how durable you are. He's probably going to knock you out. Uh, I know Tai Tuivasa ate one of them, but, like, you know, he had a big shot from Derek Lewis. Nobody really does. Good for him. Most people aren't going to eat that. I don't think De is going to be able to eat shots from Derek Lewis. Let's put it that way. Uh, dude's got lights out power, and he keeps it throughout the fight. His timing is excellent. His counters are excellent. However... We just haven't seen it as well lately because he's been coming out of there just like ready to roll, trying to get out of there quick. When he, what he needs to do is go back to that nice, patient Derek Lewis, let the opponent come to you, which I don't think he's going to have a problem here because Rogerio is going to come across the cage and try to, try to end it quick. And then Derek Lewis uses that timing and those countering abilities that he's used against guys like Curtis Blades where he put him into the shadow realm by waiting for that shot, hitting him with the uppercut, things like that. Now, he mostly throws single shots. I don't normally like that. I put it as a negative here. But for Derek Lewis, it works fine because usually it one's all it takes. But I don't usually like that. It's something to keep in mind. He's also a surprisingly athletic individual, and he just kind of gets up when he's taken down. Here's the thing. I want to pick Derek Lewis so freaking bad. I want to. I, I will not be surprised one bit if he just goes and just... Dulima comes across the cage, and boom, right there. Big shot. Lewis knocks him out. Game over. Derek Lewis is like, oh, yo, what? Did you guys forget who I was? You forget who I'm knocking, that I'm holding the record for most knockouts in the heavyweight division? And we're all sitting there like, yeah, damn, we did forget. That was stupid. But you, you kind of have to go with the momentum here. You got to go with Rogerio de Lima. 
Pass on this fight, though, by the way. Don't bet on this fight. I'm not betting on this fight. If you're betting on this fight, I don't know. You could just be a total degenerate. I understand that. Or, you know, maybe maybe you think you've got a better read than I do, and you could have something. So let me know in the comments if you do. I'll take the Lima for the pick, but I don't like it. I don't even want him to win. I want Derek Lewis to win because I want to see him knock him out and do that thing where he goes on the floor and does, ah, you know what I mean? I want to see Derek Lewis win, but the Lima's the pick, I guess. Let me know what you guys think. I'll see you in the wrap up next. We have Trevin Giles. He's taking on Gabriel Bonfim. Bonfim, 5-0 in the last five because the dude's undefeated on the career. Giles, 3-2 and two in the last five. So, for this one here, Bonfim, he's got solid striking, predominantly boxing, but he has solid striking in general. Dude's got great combinations with a ton of speed, countering ability, and he's going to press forward and try to walk his opponents down. But here's the problem. When he's at full range, when he's way out there and he hasn't started pressing his opponents and causing them to back up, he can be hit. He doesn't, uh, I don't know, somehow he lets shots get through. That's what happens. At range, he gets hit. Once he starts closing that distance, he gets hit a lot less. When it gets to the mat, dude's got solid BJJ. In fact, lights out on the submissions. Dude's fantastic when he gets to the ground. Very large toolbox. Very quick to attack the submissions. He's very po positionally sound. Whether he's on top or bottom, he's put in the position where he needs it to be in order to get the submission. Now, when it comes to Trevin Giles, the guy's kind of inconsistent. You know what I think about inconsistent fighters, but here's the deal. He's got good striking. He can work his combinations as well. The thing that he, I do like about him, he's got that stiff jab. And what, does he have, what, what is good about that stiff jab? Well, we got Bonfim that gets hit at range, and that's something that, that Trevin Giles can start doing is starting working that jab, working that footwork, keeping outside, and then also trying to counter a little bit, throw the, you know, throw the right hand or, the, uh, what are, or the, the left hand or whatever the heck. Um, once the uh, counter shots are opening up because he's working that stiff jab at range against a guy like Bonfim. Problem is, sometimes he's a little bit low volume and you can't be low volume when Bonfim's trying to walk you down. So that could be a problem for him. Now, when it comes to the grappling, he's got good grappling. He's got, uh, it, it's hard to really break down. He has a good choking arsenal. He looks for, you know, different styles of chokes, whether it be arm triangle, rear naked choke, um, you know, what, whatever it is. He's looking for chokes. Why is that? Well, I don't know. Maybe this is a police officer. That's the thing that you learn in the police academy because you're not learning things like arm bars and knee bars in the police academy. What you're learning is chokes to subdue an opponent. Well, he's good at them. I don't know if it has anything to do with that or it's just a coincidence that that seems to be the submission he tries to go to is different types of chokes, but he does. And he's got good takedown or well, decent takedowns and decent takedown defense. I think this fight is a very interesting one. And I think it's going to come down to whether or not bomb theme can close that distance. And I think he can. I think Bonfim gets this one done more often than not. I think he's going to run over Trevin Giles here. And I think Trevin Giles is a talented fighter, but he's just not going to have what Bonfim is, is, uh, it needs to be stopped. So he's not going to have the tools to shut down a guy like Bonfim who's coming forward, looking, looking for the knockout on the feet, and then immediately going for that submission when he gets the match. So give me Bonfim. Let me know what you guys have, and I will see you in the next You've just been fight. watching along, and you haven't done it yet. Do me a solid. Click that like button on this video. I appreciate it very much. The reason I ask for that is because, well, it helps YouTube say, oh, this is a video that people like, and then it shows it to more people. I don't know if it was the lack of likes or what, but uh, UFC London video did not get as many views as my normal views or, or videos do for a full card breakdown. No idea why. It was like 300 views short, which is a pretty, pretty big chunk. So I don't know what happened there. UFC London was a big card. I don't know. Either way, do me a solid, like this video, and maybe share it with some friends because that'll really help me a lot. It'll help you guys because you know I'm going to be making these con this content. Keep these videos coming. So if you enjoy this stuff, hit like for me. It goes a long way. Now, and it doesn't cost you a penny. Now, uh, at welterweight, we have Kevin Holland, and he's taking on Michael Chiesa. Both guys, 3-2 and two in their last five fights. Holland's going to be much taller and longer. He's 6'3 with an 81-inch reach as opposed to the 6'1", 75-and-a-half-inch reach of a guy like Chiesa. Now, all these bugs, I don't know how they got in. There's little gnats flying around. Anyway, Kevin Holland, he's got good striking, and especially the range striking, because he's got long, straight punches, and he's going to be able to use that long 81-inch reach that he has to land those shots with power, accuracy, and speed. Even better, the striking defense is pretty good because he can keep guys at range, and while he keeps guys at range landing his shots, they have a hard time hitting him, especially because usually he's going to have those longer arms. Now, when it comes to the jiu-jitsu, he's got good jiu-jitsu. I understand people have been taking him down, laying on top of him, and controlling him. That was at middleweight. At welterweight, we haven't seen that yet, and I do think his jiu-jitsu is pretty good. He's got good front chokes. He's got them skinny choking arms, those 81-inch arms. Gets up under the chin, looking for the choke. The front chokes are there. He's also got good sweeps and good scrambles. I don't think he's going to be able to sweep or out-scramble a guy like Chiesa, but there it is. Now, for Michael Chiesa, I put decent striking on the board, and I'm being very generous there. Striking... 
it's just all right, okay? It's serviceable. He's going to use it because he needs to throw something to set up a takedown because if he just starts shooting takedowns clear out of the range of Kevin Holland. I don't think he's going to be able to get much out of that. So, solid grappling for him, though. He's got solid grappling. He likes to body lock takedown. That's what he's going to go for most of the time. Once he gets the fight to the mat, he's got excellent control. He uses transitions very well to get to the next position. He's going to look to take the back and control guys from the back, start looking for that rear naked choke or something like that. Um, mixes in some ground and pound as well as the submission attempts to keep guys guessing and start looking for those finishes. Now, Kiesa has a very good path to victory here on the grappling, but he has to get the fight to the mat. I think he's going to have a really hard time closing that range. Holland's going to be able to land those shots at range because Kiesa is going to have a hard time getting close when Holland knows that there is zero threat of the striking from Michael Kiesa. And when Holland is landing those shots at range, at will, it's going to be much easier for him to relax land those shots, and know that anytime time Kiesa shoots, it's from way out of range. So for me, I think Kevin Holland gets this one done. He might even get the knockout, but I think it's just playing him straight is the way to play him if you're going to bet it. Uh, Kevin Holland's probably going to get this one done. I think he wins. I think he's going to be able to land those shots, and it's going to be pretty clear that Holland is going to be able to, to stop Kiesa from getting a hold of him. And if he does, if Kiesa does get a hold of him, I think it's going to be late enough in the round that Holland's already got, it, uh, got the ability to put in the work, got the opportunity to put in the work, land some good shots and still win it on the scorecards in that round so let me know what you guys think i'm sticking with holland love to hear from you and i'll see a matchup that i think a lot of us would feel very differently about had it happened a few years ago we have bobby green taking on tony ferguson and for both guys lackluster five on ends we have two two and a no contest for green but a very abysmal zero and five for tony ferguson on the last five fights now i understand a lot of those against top level competition it's still not a good look. He hasn't won a fight in quite some time. Now, for Bobby Green, coming up that no contest with the headbutt, I think headbutt should be legal. I know nobody else does, but I think they should. I wish it was a thing. Either way, uh, Bobby Green, he is a slick boxer. What he's going to do is use that head movement and shoulder roll that he does to be able to avoid punches and strikes from his opponents. He's got pretty good volume. He's got punches that come from all different kinds of angles because his hands are low, using those shoulders, throwing those punches from down here. Makes it hard to see, but also kind of makes it so he can be hit with, you know, with multiple combinations as he's trying to lean back and roll. If you're a guy that's falling up with many different shots from different angles, you might be able to catch him. But either way, he's usually pretty good about getting out of the, uh, the brunt of the shot. Um, he does have good wrestling. He usually, usually uses it defensively these days with a sprawl and maybe to scramble if he needs to from there. Now, for Tony Ferguson. Now, I'm going to break down a lot of stuff for Tony Ferguson. But take everything with a grain of salt because a lot of it's just slightly less than it was before. So he's still got a high pace and he still has that killer instinct in him. It's just not quite the same. Now, he's got solid striking with good forward pressure. We know that. He's got good volume. We still know that. The elbows and the leg kicks are still there and they're very damaging strikes. Here's the thing that Tony Ferguson has that Bobby Green's rolling, shoulder rolling, I mean, able to like roll uh, with a punch is not going to be doing well for is the elbows because even if you roll that elbow can still slice you and cut your skin and when it does guess what tko's to cut due to cuts happen so that is something that that tony ferguson has in his in his arsenal he's a very bony sharp little goblin so tony ferguson could get the cut and get a tko stoppage over over bobby green even if he's losing the fight now when it comes to the grappling he's got good wrestling he's got a good sprawl he can work in his own takedowns. It's they're they're kind of unorthodox a lot of times. Sometimes he'll just like roll for a leg, like an MNRA roll or whatever. Um, but he does have good submission game, good choking arms. He's got them long, rangy arms, long, skinny arms. I think he's got like a 76 inch reach, which is pretty good. Um, sweeps, scrambles. He's got that ground and pound. Yep, yep, good deal. He's got them elbows from the top or from the bottom. It's very important. But the problem with Tony Ferguson is the clear decline that we see him have now. Tony Ferguson, if this was prior to the Nate Diaz fight, I would consider taking Tony Ferguson because I would say, you know what? I think his style would be tough for a guy like Bobby Green to not take damage. And on the judges' scorecards, you never know. But I just don't think Tony Ferguson is going to be able to do it. I don't think he's got it left. That Justin Gaethje fight, that was it. That was the end of Tony Ferguson. The damage that he absorbed in that matchup that was just too much for him. I, he's not been the same since. I think Bobby Green is going to get this win. I don't know whether he finishes him or not. Ferguson's still kind of tough. He's just durable. He just still can take shots, but he shouldn't. So I'm going to take Bobby Green in this matchup. I know most people are. 
And I would be even more confident in him if I wasn't worried about something like a cut stoppage or something like that. Just that could happen. So I'm going to take Bobby Green. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you in the next Well to wait. And real quick, have you guys heard about channel memberships? We've got a channel membership here that you can get for only $2.99. Get you access to these cool little uh, little badges that go next to your name when you make comments on the videos. It's always nice for to see from me, but also it's cool because all the other people in the comments are going to be like, oh man, look at that cool cool uh, badge that so-and-so has next to their name. And it depicts how long they've been supporting this channel. That's pretty neat. That's cool. But you also get access to some sweet emojis like my can of root beer, my bottle of root beer. Uh, what else is in there? The, uh, the marker board, all sorts of things that you see from this channel. You get that down in there. You also get my logo as a, as a, as a comment uh, emoji. So that's cool. Whatever. Channel memberships. They're neat. $2.99. It's a great way to help out the channel and just kind of feel like part of the team. Now, into this fight. Steven Thompson, Mikhail Pereira, 170, welterweight matchup. 5-0 and in the last five, Pereira. Uh, we got a bug on the board here. If you can see him, well, hopefully he leaves us alone. Uh, Stephen Thompson, three and two in the last five. Biggest issue for Thompson, he's 40 years old. He's fighting a 29-year-old in Pereira. I don't think that's an issue uh, as far as the way he looked in his last fight, but age is a uh, interesting thing, and sometimes it just catches you out of nowhere. We're going to start with Pereira here. He's got good striking, good movement, and it's kind of un uh, unpredictable. Kind of uses that Caporera si uh, style. He's got the flying knees, very damaging. It's hard to block a flying knee. If you block a flying knee, it's still going to hurt really bad. So flying knees are really important. He's got good movement. Uh, he'll use the cage to kind of like push off and throw like a Superman punch or stuff like that. Uh, very unorthodox style, all right? So I do like the striking there, but unfortunately he's, for him, he's going up against a guy in Stephen Thompson who's one of the better strikers in the entire UFC. But uh, on the ground... Pereira's got good jiu-jitsu. He's very positionally sound, good scrambles. He'll look for submissions as well. Kind of, he, he just, He's just good at jiu-jitsu. Now, here's the thing. I don't think he's going to get there very often because Thompson's got pretty good takedown defense, and when he gets to the ground, he stays safe. Problem is, he can be held on his back once you get him flattened out, but he does have pretty good initial takedown defense. Gets his legs really wide and starts working to pull people up once he's up against the fence or whatever. Um, so he's got that. Plus, he's got fantastic cardio, so it's going to be very hard to... Uh, to wear him out and then get him down that way. Now, when it comes to the striking, I will tell you now, I had a lot more notes on Steven Thompson, but here's the deal. I didn't have that many notes on Pereira because there's a ton of Steven Thompson footage and Pereira, you gotta throw a lot of it out because he's changed his style a lot and now he's getting a little bit more refined and a lot of that stuff that he used to do, he doesn't really do so much. Like, you're not seeing him do backflips on people anymore. I don't think he's gonna do that here either. So, so anyway, Ton more notes for Stephen Thompson. If you want to see it, patreon.com slash 138MMA. You can get access to all of my notes there. I'm not going to give you the full plug, but I'm just telling you where you can find it. Now, he's got high-level striking. Fantastic range control. And when he, what he does is he moves in, lands his strikes, and gets out before you can realize, oh, crap, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to hit this guy when he came in. Too late. He already pieced you up with a combination and got out. He's got fantastic combos from either stance. They, they're quick. Comes from any odd angle. He can throw stuff off his lead leg, just like expert level. Um, his kicking arsenal is some of the best in the entire UFC. The, the best part about it is he can mix his kicks into combinations. Now, when he mixes his kicks up into combinations, a lot of people, they either can start a combination with a kick or end a combination with a kick. Thompson has this weird ability where he can throw kicks anywhere. Like he could throw jab, head kick, cross, hook, you know, body kick into like a, you know, another cross or something. Like, I'm just throwing stuff together in my head right there. He just throws kicks mid combo and goes right into his hands. Not many people can do that. And if you think that that's easy, try it. Try it in some in a sparring match and you're going to say, oh, that's a lot harder than I thought. He does it very well. He stays balanced, smooth, technical. It's fantastic. He's one of the better strikers in the entire UFC. I've said that already. I'm, I can't put that out there enough. Um, he's also got the ability to counter guys because he's got that stance here. It's pretty low, pretty wide. And when guys try to come in and close that range, he's very good at countering and moving laterally to get away um, and, you know, using those counters on the way out. Steven Thompson's winning this matchup. If he loses this matchup, I'll be very surprised. And if he does, it's because the age finally caught up to him. Steven Thompson should win this matchup, though. You run this fight 100 times, he wins most of those. Probably 100 of them. I think he's better here everywhere, except for the age that's a problem. Um, and obviously, if he gets flattened out on the mat for three rounds, he could lose that. But... Steven Thompson's winning this fight. Let me know what you guys think. I'll see you in the next fight. I'd love to hear your comments because if you're on the Pereira side, I know a lot of people are. 
I want to hear from you and why you think so. What do you think he's going to do to beat Stephen Thompson? Or is it simply the age? Because if so, I might give you that point. All right, see you the next the evening at the 205-pound light heavyweight division. This is a matchup that a lot of people are kind of split on because we have two absolute power punchers, two absolute monsters at 205 pounds. Alex Pereira, 4-1 in his last five. He's taking on Jan Blahovic, who is 3-1 in a draw in his last five. Although, I thought he won that draw. I thought he won the first three three rounds against Ankoliev. I understand, that, I, I, and I'll take the draw, but I thought he won the first three rounds. Oh, well. Either way, we move on. Jan Blahovic, Alex Pereira. Here's what we've got. So the striking of Alex Pereira is obviously his, his path to victory in any fight, okay? He's a striker. Alex Pereira is a very strong striker with a good range striking, and he uses his natural, his natural length very well. Keeps guys at range while pressing forward and walking them down. He's got a good forward press, but he keeps them at range until, he's, until they run into the cage, and then he comes in and starts landing big combinations hooks, uppercuts, going to the straight. He mixes in the different combos. He's very good at that, and his power is absolutely deadly, and we all know about that lead hook that he hits. He can throw it as a regular, just good old-fashioned punch, or he can throw it as a counter punch, and he does it very well both ways, and when he does it, it's got lights-out power when he hits. He's got some of the best power that we've seen at middleweight, and at light heavyweight, I'm sure it's going to translate just as well. When he's walking guys forward, though, his striking defense is interesting because he uses the kind of like power or the parry and head movement. So his hands are out here. So he is open to hooks of his own. So someone could come out to the outside and hit him with a hook. And, uh, and that would be where he's susceptible. It's funny because his best punch is his lead hook, which will sometimes come here and come up over the top like that. And that's his best punch, right? But that's what he's also susceptible to is getting hit with that because he's out front trying to trap hands and parry this way. He does it very well, though, and his long, rangy arms do keep people from getting close enough to land that hook a lot of the time. Now, he also has very good knees. They're very heavy, walks through, throws them up the middle. It's a good way to keep guys from wanting to shoot takedowns on you, and he's, he's used it very well for that. But the flying knee is the extension of that. He can throw it, and then, oh, guess what? We're coming up to a flying knee. I just jumped. I don't think I should be doing that in my house. Who knows? Things could fall off the wall. Whatever. Anyway, uh, flying knee. He's got, but the knees in general are very good. Now, for, for Pereira, he is able to switch. Uh, okay, so a lot of guys, they're either combo strikers or single strikers. Pereira can switch between the two. He can be going from a combination, reset, throw a big single shot, big single shot, Back to a combination, and it's very impressive because it keeps the, guy, the opponents guessing what kind of strikes are we going to see from this guy, what's coming next, how is it coming, and he throws a pretty good angles, different different shots from different different styles and different angles, whatever. Um, he's also going to slam the leg kick, I didn't write that up there, but he's going to slam the leg kick very well, uses that import, uh, impressively. He also is going to check both leg kicks and body kicks, and that's going to be very important in this matchup, and you're going to see why in just a moment. For Jan Blachowicz, he's a solid striker as well. That legendary Polish power is real. His lead hook is also very dangerous, which is what Pereira is susceptible to. Um, also, the uh, exceptional power in his leg and body kicks. When Blachowicz was landing those leg kicks on Ankoliev, dude could hardly walk. If you remember the body kicks that he landed on Dominic Reyes, that dude turned purple after the first kick, and it just was brutal. He has some serious power in those kicks. It doesn't matter if you block them. However... If you're going to check him, and we've got a guy like Pereira who's checking both leg and body kicks, that's a different story. It's not the same as blocking a kick with your arm and just uh, taking the shot and being like, all right, I took it, blocked it, whatever. If you check it with that knee, and especially if you check it aggressively, that's different. Now, Blahovich checks kicks as well. So if, if, if Pereira's going to start throwing those leg kicks, there's the chance that he checks it. And he's got some dense bones. We found that out already with the way that he was able to slam those kicks on uh, on Ankoliev. And sometimes those were just landing kick to kick where they both throw. Very impressive there. But either way, uh, for Bohovic, the kicking game is going to be interesting. We're going to see who's going to get the advantage with Pereira and him because, like I said, the, they both are going to check kicks and they're both going to be throwing a lot of kicks. It's just who's going to win out in that one. Now, with, with the lead hook discrepancy here, I don't so much see that Bohovic is going to be able to land that lead hook as easily as someone who's a little bit taller and longer. Now, I know that Jan Bohovic is a fairly big guy, but
but he's just not quite, he doesn't quite have the range that a guy like Pereira does. So for him, he's gonna have to get in tight enough to get around that, that parry with the hands out here like this. He's gonna have to be able to get around that. And that's gonna be tough to do unless he's setting up those strikes. So it's not just gonna be one big counter hook unless he ends up backing up against the cage, whatever. We've got different scenarios. We're not gonna dive too deep into that. Point is, they both have good counters to each other's strengths, or to each other's weaknesses, sorry. Uh, the tight defense from Bohovic is very important here too because he's going to be able to keep those hands up when he needs to. And he's a durable guy if he does get, get hit. When it comes to the grappling, and this is what everybody's talking about, is he, he, is he going to be able just to out-grapple Pereira? Yeah, he possibly could. But I don't think it's going to be that easy. I think Pereira's got good takedown defense. I think he's learning from, from some of the best over there training with Glover Teixeira. I think he's going to be able to stuff some takedowns if he needs to. But... If Jan Bohovic does get on top, he is incredibly heavy on top, and I think he's going to have some serious advantages once he does get on top, if he does. However, I think we're going to get a striking match a lot of the time, and here's what I think is going to happen. Whew, okay, hold on. I'm going to be honest with you. This is a really tough one to pick, and I still may switch my pick on this one, but here's what I think is going to happen for now. Here's what, here's what I'm at. I think Pereira's going to have some success coming out early, landing some good shots, but Blahovich is going to start slamming body kicks and just not giving a rip whether or not Pereira blocks him, checks him, whatever. And I think he's going to start to get Pereira going, like, what is this guy made of? And start taking a couple steps back. And I think Blahovich is going to start landing those, landing those big body kicks, big leg kicks. And I think that he's just going to start swearing on him. Now, first round, Pereira's going to win it. Second round, Blahovich is going to win it. And we get to the third round after Blahovich is landing those big shots, and Pereira's like, man. I don't want to deal with that again. That's when Blahovich goes to the wrestling. That's when he gets the takedown, and he lays on him for the third round, maybe laying some decent ground and pound, whatever, just enough to keep the fight there, and Blahovich wins a very close decision. That's where I'm at right now. It could change because, like I said, if Pereira could, is probably going to win the first round. I think he's going to come out strong, and I think he's going to land some big shots, and if he does, he could actually put Blahovich down because the guy hits like a truck. That's where I'm at. I'm leaning Blahovich for right now. But let me know what you guys think. Let me know where you're at on this one because this is a really tricky one. And we're going to check out the main event here shortly. But don't forget to check out my in-depth fight analysis on that main event. It's going to be at the end screen of this video. Just like I'll probably tell you in a couple seconds. See you in the main event. We now arrive at the main event of the evening. And real quick, this is your last reminder. Hey, like this video. I appreciate it very much when you do so. It shows your support for the channel. Helps this channel grow. And it doesn't cost you a single penny. All you got to do is just click that like button and help me out. Help yourselves out so this channel keeps coming. You guys like watching my content. Guess what? You got to like the videos. Helps me know that. And it helps the YouTube algorithm know that. So do that for me. Uh, main event, Justin Gaethje, Dustin Poirier. If you didn't see it already, I did break this one down in depth on another video, a standalone video that will be popping up on the screen any minute. Uh, maybe it already has. Either way, you can watch that there. Um, I'm not going to waste your time doing it again because... You can watch it right there in, in depth. So also, if you haven't checked out Bellator versus Ryzen, it's the same day as this UFC card. Check out the breakdown videos for that. It should already be out and should be linked right here as well. One of them, one of the videos is Bellator Ryzen. One is the, uh, the Justin Gaethje, Dustin Poirier. Check them out. I appreciate it very much. Share this video with your friends, and I will see you in one of these videos. Thanks.